From 1921 to 1929, the Fed again increased the money supply, resulting once again in extensive loans to the public and banks. There was also a fairly new type of loan called a margin loan in the stock market. Very simply, the margin loan allowed an investor to put down only 10% of a stock's price, with the other 90% being loaned through the broker. In other words, a person could own $1,000 worth of stock with only $100 down. This method was very popular in the roaring 1920s, as everyone seemed to be making money in the market. However, there was a catch to this loan. It could be called in at any time and had to be paid within 24 hours. This is termed a margin call, and the typical result of a margin call is the selling of the stock purchased with the loan. So, a few months before October in 1929, J.D. Rockefeller, Bernard Barak, and other insiders quietly exited the market. And on October 24, 1929, the New York financiers who furnished the margin loans started calling them in in mass. This sparked an instantaneous, massive sell-off in the market, for everyone had to cover the margin loans. It then triggered mass bank runs for the same reason, in turn collapsing over 16,000 banks, enabling the conspiring international bankers to not only buy up rival banks at a discount, but to also buy up whole corporations at pennies on the dollar. It was the greatest robbery in American history. But that didn't stop there. Rather than expanding the money supply in order to recover from this economic collapse, the Fed actually contracted it, fueling one of the largest depressions in history. Once again outraged, Congressman Lewis McFadden, a longtime opponent of the banking cartels, began bringing impeachment proceedings against the Federal Reserve Board, saying of the crash and depression, it was a carefully contrived occurrence. International bankers sought to bring about a condition of despair so that they might emerge the rulers of us all. Not surprisingly, and after two previous assassination attempts, McFadden was poisoned at a banquet before he could push for the impeachment. Now, having reduced the society to squalor, the Federal Reserve bankers decided that the gold standard should be removed. In order to do this, they needed to acquire the remaining gold in the system. So, under the pretense of helping to end the depression, came the 1933 gold seizure. Under the threat of imprisonment for 10 years, everyone in America was required to turn in all gold bullion to the treasury, essentially robbing the public of what little wealth they had left. And at the end of 1933, the gold standard was abolished. If you look at a dollar bill from before 1933, it says it is redeemable in gold. If you look at a dollar bill today, it says it is legal tender, which means it is backed by absolutely nothing. It is worthless paper. The only thing that gives our money value is how much of it is in circulation. Therefore, the power to regulate the money supply is also the power to regulate its value, which is also the power to bring entire economies and societies to its knees. It's important to clearly understand, the Federal Reserve is a private corporation. It is about as federal as Federal Express. It makes its own policies and is under virtually no regulation by the U.S. government. It is a private bank that loans all the currency at interest to the government, completely consistent with the fraudulent central banking model that the country sought to escape from when it declared independence in the American Revolutionary War. Now, going back to 1913, the Federal Reserve Act was not the only unconstitutional bill pushed through Congress. They also pushed the federal income tax. It's worthwhile to point out that the American public's ignorance towards the federal income tax is a testament to how dumbed down and oblivious the American population really is. First of all, the federal income tax is completely unconstitutional, as it is a direct, unapportioned tax. All direct taxes have to be apportioned to be legal based on the Constitution. Secondly, the required number of states in order to ratify the amendment to allow the income tax was never met. And this has even been cited in modern court cases. Third, at the present day, roughly 25% of the average worker's income is taken via this tax. And guess where that money goes? It goes to pay the interest on the currency being produced by the fraudulent Federal Reserve Bank, a system that does not have to exist at all. The money you make working almost three months out of the year goes almost literally into the pockets of the international bankers who own the private Federal Reserve Bank. And fourth, even with the fraudulent government claim as to the legality of the income tax, there is literally no statute, no law in existence that requires you to pay this tax, period. I really expected that, of course, there's a law that you can point to in the law book. 
the code that requires you to file a tax return. Of course there is. I was at that point where I couldn't find the statute that clearly made a person liable, uh, at least not me and uh, most people I know, and I had no, no choice in my mind except to, to resign. Based on the research that I did throughout the year 2000 and that I'm still doing, I have not found that law. I've asked uh, Congress, we've asked a lot of people in the IRS, the IRS commissioners, helpers. They can't answer because if they answer, the American people are going to know that this whole thing is a fraud. I haven't uh, filed an income, federal income tax return since I left. I have not filed a tax return since 1999. The income tax is nothing less than the enslavement of the entire country. Now, the control of the economy and the perpetual robbery of wealth is only one side of the Rubik's Cube the bankers hold in their hands. The next tool for profit and control is war. Since the inception of the Federal Reserve in 1913, a number of large and small wars have commenced. The three most pronounced were World War I, World War II, and Vietnam. World War I. In 1914, European wars broke out centered around England and Germany. The American public wanted nothing to do with the war. In turn, President Woodrow Wilson publicly declared neutrality. However, under the surface, the U.S. administration was looking for any excuse it could find to enter it. In a noted observation by Secretary of State William Jennings, the large banking interests were deeply interested in the World War because of the wide opportunities for large profits. It's important to understand that the most lucrative thing that can happen for the international bankers is war, for it forces the country to borrow even more money from the Federal Reserve Bank at interest. Woodrow Wilson's top advisor and mentor was Colonel Edward House, a man with intimate connections with the international bankers who wanted in the war. In a documented conversation between Colonel House, Wilson's advisor, and Sir Edward Grey, the Foreign Secretary of England, regarding how to get America into the war, Grey inquired, what will Americans do if Germans sink an ocean liner with American passengers on board? House responded, I believe that a flame of indignation would sweep the United States and that by itself would be sufficient to carry us into war. So on May 7, 1915, on essentially the suggestion of Sir Edward Grey, a ship called the Lusitania was deliberately sent into German controlled waters where German military vessels were known to be. And as expected, German U-boats torpedoed the ship, exploding stored ammunition, killing 1,200 people. To further understand the deliberate nature of this setup, the German embassy actually put advertisements in the New York Times telling people that if they boarded the Lusitania, they did so at their own risk, as such a ship sailing from America to England through the war zone would be liable to destruction. In turn, and as anticipated, the sinking of the Lusitania caused a wave of anger among the American population, and America entered the war a short time after. The First World War caused 323,000 American deaths. J.D. Rockefeller made $200 million off of it. Not to mention the war cost about $30 billion for America, most of which was borrowed from the Federal Reserve Bank at interest, furthering the profits of the international bankers. World War II. On December 7, 1941, Japan attacked the American fleet at Pearl Harbor, triggering our entry into that war. President Franklin D. Roosevelt declared the attack was a day that will live in infamy. A day of infamy indeed, but not because of the alleged surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. After 60 years of surfacing information, it is clear that not only was the attack on Pearl Harbor known weeks in advance, it was outright wanted and provoked. Roosevelt, whose family had been New York bankers since the 18th century, whose uncle Frederick was on the original Federal Reserve Board, was very sympathetic to the interests of the international bankers, and the interest was to enter the war, as as we've seen, nothing is more profitable for international bankers than war. In a journal entry by Roosevelt's Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, dated November 25, 1941, he documented a conversation he had with Roosevelt. The question was, how should we maneuver them into firing the first shot? It was desirable to make sure the Japanese be the ones to do this, so that there should remain no doubt as to who were the aggressors. In the months leading up to the attack on Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt had done almost everything in his power to anger the Japanese, showing a posture of aggression. He halted all of Japan's imports of American petroleum. He froze all the Japanese assets in the United States. He made public loans to nationalist China and supplied military aid to the British, both enemies of Japan in the war, which by the way is completely in violation of international war rules. 
And on December 4th, three days before the attack, Australian intelligence told Roosevelt about a Japanese task force moving towards Pearl Harbor. Roosevelt ignored it. So, as hoped and allowed, on December 7th, 1941, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, killing 2,400 soldiers. Before Pearl Harbor, 83% of the American public wanted nothing to do with the war. After Pearl Harbor, one million men volunteered for the war.